we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human being with various feelings that exist inside, inside the heart and the mind of the human being. Allah mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one that makes you laugh and makes you cry. And the same surah inside surah Al-Najm, Allah continues the concept of the human being by mentioning that those individuals, when they listen to the Qur'an, Allah mentions about them, وَتَدْحَكُونَ وَلَا تَبْكُونَ That you laugh and you don't weep. وَأَنْتُمْ سَامِدُونَ And you're busy in your play and your amusement. And some of the ulama of Tafasir, they mention that Samidun بِلُّغَ الْحَبَّشِيَةِ speaks about music and singing in such nature. So all this is speaking about the emotional feelings that we're trying to extract that a human being has. Then Allah concludes the surah, Surah Al-Najm, the 53rd chapter of the Qur'an, by mentioning here, فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا Another inner feeling of the human being of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in easier terms, we find a human being has what's known as the five al-hawas, the five sensual feelings that a person has of, of looking, listening, hearing, smell and taste. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the human being. And so people express themselves in different ways about things that they feel. As we have like the famous statement that love is blind, as they say, love has a feeling that one cannot describe, an undescribable feeling. Or when people, even when they carry out their haram actions, they say that it has a feeling, you know, whatever it may be, intoxicants, whatever it may be, gives them that sensual feeling that they want to continuously reach that upper, that higher limit or get high once again to have that feeling to come again once again inside their life. And then we find that this continuous habitual practice that have to keep on taking dosages and dosages of finding that happiness until eventually, may Allah forbid that some of them, they end up losing their lives because they try to reach that sensual feeling. So there's nothing wrong with having sensual feelings. It's when the sensual feelings turn into elements of haram, which is forbidden. The feeling that we want to speak about today, which is truly undescribable, is the feeling of iman. Halawatul iman. Even the hadith that we're going to discuss, it speaks about, calls it halawatul iman, the sweetness of faith. So the terminology is something which is relevant to all of us, that this must be something that we, that we enjoy that feeling that exists inside the heart of the human being, that obviously the masses of people are searching for that feeling. Obviously they turn to these other incorrect pleasures or practices to try to find that central feeling, that good feeling of contentment inside you know, their heart. So we find that that undescribable feeling is the feeling of al-iman. Whoever finds that feeling of iman inside their heart, then that is truly the highest level of iman to a certain degree, that they find that contentment what they've been searching for inside their life. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, various pla- very numerous places inside the Quran, مَنْ عَمِلَ الصَّالِحَ مِنْ ذَكْرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوْ مُؤْمِنْ فَلَنُحِيَنَّوْ حَيَاتٌ طَيِّبًا Whoever believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries out righteous action, whether it be male or female, وَهُوْ مُؤْمِنْ They're believing individuals, فَلَنُحِيَنَّوْ حَيَاتٌ طَيِّبًا will give them a good life. So obviously here, good life can mean the literal meaning of the good life, things of the dunya. But the really deeper inner meaning is one of contentment. As Allah mentioned, Surah Al-Ra'd, the 13th chapter of the Quran, those who believe, their hearts find contentment with the dhikr of Allah, Allah bi dhikri tatma'innul qulub. In the dhikr of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, do hearts find peace and contentment. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that those individuals who turn away from the dhikr of Allah, Inside Surah Taha, Allah mentioned, وَمَنْ أَعْرَدَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً دَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى قَالَ رَبِّ لِمَا حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا قَالَ كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَسِيتَهَا وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى Inside Surah Taha, Allah mentioned, وَمَنْ أَعْرَدَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ Whoever turns away from my dhikr, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a promise that that individual, فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً دَنْكَ that individual have a restricted life. The first meaning is restricted life inside the grave. Dunk fil qabr. The restriction inside the grave will be even more so for the person who turns away from dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second meaning, which is plausible as well, is the person will have a wretched life. A life with no contentment and no peace. 
Then on top of that, when ahshuru yom al qiyamati a'ma kafif, Allah raised the individual day of judgment in a state of blindness. Qala Rabbi lima hashadtani a'ma. Oh my Lord, why have you made me blind? Wa qad kuntu basira. I could see inside this dunya. Qala kadalik atatka ayatuna fanasitaha. Dust of signs came of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside this world, but you forgot about them. Wa kadalik al yawma tunsa. And today you'll be forgotten by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgets about a person, the forgetting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning inside this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns away from this individual. A'rad anhu. Turns away from his individual inside his dunya, leaves this individual to follow whatever path they want to follow, and even more so inside yani, al akhirah. Allah mentions inside the Quran, Afaman Sharah Allah Sadru lil Islam, Fahu ala nuri mi rabbihi. So that content of Islam on Iman, Allah describes it as an expansion of the chest of the individual. Contentment inside the heart of Iman is placed here. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides the individual, to Al-Islam, they find this peace and contentment inside their heart. For who ala nuri mi rabbi, that person is light from his Lord, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another place inside the Quran Allah mentions something similar. فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّوَ إِنْ يَحْدِيَهُ يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَوْ لِلْإِسْلَامِ Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to guide, he expands his chest towards Islam. وَمَنْ يُرِدْ أَنْ يُضِلَّهُ Whoever Allah wants to misguide, يَجْعَلْ صَدْرُهُ دَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَسَّعَدُ فِي السَّمَا if Allah wants to misguide, makes that individual's chest to become restrained, restrained, restricted. As if that person is traversing upper into the, into the skies, into the heavens. And we know the altitude, the more higher you, you go into the sky, you find the more the pure the air becomes, it becomes difficult for the person to breathe. So even linguistically, it's true. But a deeper meaning is that once again, there's always bleak, qalaq. There's always something inside their heart. There's a lack of contentment inside their heart because they're away from that iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَذَلِكَ يَجْعَ اللَّهُ رِجْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ And this is the, the filth, the corruption that Allah places upon those individuals who do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today's hadith that we want to dissect and look into is this hadith that's narrated by Anas ibn Malik inside Bukhari yani, and Muslim. And as a side point, if you look at Sahih Muslims, his first chapter entitled Kitabul Iman, the book of Iman. And that's we find that some ulama have gone to the view that Sahih Muslim, that its tabweeb, its chapters, its organization, its head, title headings is better than Imam Bukhari. So this is what some ulama have gone to the view. Obviously in authenticity, Sahih Bukhari is the most authentic book but the Kitab Billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most authentic book in authenticity. But you can begin to see, if you read Sahih Muslim, that you begin to see why certain reasons, why certain ulama preferred Sahih Muslim in the way that he's laid out certain things. So he begins his book with the book of Iman. So obviously some of us may not be able to read all, all books of, of hadith in, 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 inside, inside our life, etc. But read certain chapters, certain sections. And you'll see why the reason why it, some certain books of a hadith are more powerful. Read Kitab al-Iman of Sahih Muslim and then read the end towards the end of Kitab al-Jannah wa Sifat al-Na'im, Na'imiha wa Ahliha. Read the book of paradise and the descriptive nature of the people of paradise and the characteristics of the people of paradise. So as if you start with Iman, what your Iman is, and at the end you, you, you discover or you understand what is what does my Iman lead to? What is the reward that's going to be given to me inside Al-Akhirah, what I believe in? But we find inside Sahih Muslim that you find a hadith speaking about about halawatul iman or dhawqul iman the, the sweetness of iman the taste of iman so even inside this hadith the prophet Islam, he mentioned as narrated by Anas ibn Malik thalathun man kunna fihi wajada bihinna halawatul iman three things if a person finds them inside the heart wajada bihinna halawatul iman will find the sweetness of iman another word he mentions wajada ta'm al iman will find the taste of iman so look, even the wording of the Prophet ﷺ is speaking about wording that we can relate to. Because most ahadith, and even the Quran itself, it speaks about things that we can relate to, we can understand. In the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah mentioned, that we've been given things which are similar. Abdullah bin Abbas, inside his tafsir, is mentioned, attributed to him, meaning that things of this dunya, the names are the same, but the entity is different. So when Allah speaks about paradise, speaks about rivers, speaks about green clothing, fruit, drink, rivers of honey, water, brocade, sulfurs, reclining, grapes, fruit, pomegranates, all language of the dunya, silk, 
gold, all language of dunya is all there. Why? Because the human being, as we began with, can relate to these things. So Allah speaks a language that we can relate to, we can understand. Allah doesn't speak far away. Obviously, as Ibn Abbas mentioned, the entity is totally something different, but the names are something that we can relate to these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks inside the Quran. So likewise, the Prophet, والسلام, going back to Surah Najm in the beginning, Allah mentioned, وَمَا يَمْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He doesn't speak of his own desires. What he speaks is divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his words are precise words. He's been given what's known as الْجَوَامِعُ الْكَلِمِ Concise words were given to the Prophet ﷺ. Small words, but big meaning inside the words. That's why Imam Nawi in his 40 hadith, or not actually 40 hadith, is 42 that he's collected of what is concise words of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Nawi, who made this collection that we find, and Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali went and explained these 42 hadith and added 10 more hadith to it in, in his uh, compilation explanation of, you know, of uh, the 42 hadith of Imam Nawi. But the reason why Imam Nawi also comes to mind because he was the, the scholar who wrote the Shara of Sahih Muslim in 18 or 19 volumes. So when you read the Kitab al-Iman of Sahih Muslim, then you read the explanation of, Sahih, of Imam Nawi to see how he explains these kalimat, explains you know, these words. So we find here the words of sweetness of Iman. Man kana awwalan, man kana, man kana Allah wa rasuluhu ahabba ilayhi mimma siwahuma. That the most beloved thing to the person inside their life is Allah and then his messenger, more than anything else. So if a person has that inside their heart, and they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then they love the person inside their hearts more than anything else inside their hearts, then that is a, a sign of sweetness of Iman. Secondly, when you hibb al mar'a la yuhibbu illa lillah. A person loves another human being only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, we find, when yaqra an ya'uda fil kufri ba'da an qadahullahu minhu. A person hates to go back to kufr or disbelief, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rescued that individual from that, kama yakraw an yukdafa finnar, just like the person despises to be thrown into the hellfire. Other wording it mentions, an yulqa finnari ahabba ilay min an yarji'a fil kufr. To be thrown in the hellfire, an yulqa finnari ahabba ilay min, he doesn't mind going to the hellfire in, instead of returning back to kufr and disbelief. In other wording, it mentions an yarji'a yahudiyan aw nasraniyan. Doesn't want to go back to becoming a Jew or a Christian ba'da an anqadahullahu minhu. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rescued that individual from the hellfire. I mean that iman is so strong inside their heart that they never ever want to go back to their, to their previous religion or the previous way of life that they have that strong resolution inside their heart, inside their mind. And as we find also that imam of the previous hadith prior to this mentions dhaka Iman. That is the taste, the sweetness of Iman or the tasting of Iman. Man radiya billahi rabban. Whoever finds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being their Lord. Wa bil islami deenan wa bi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rasoola. You're content with Islam being your way of life and you're happy with the Prophet Muhammad sallam being a messenger and he's guiding us to the right path. So the first thing that you find is love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we find the messenger. What is known as Muhabbatullah. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention about having the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's we find that numerous surahs inside the Quran speak about how these individuals have their belief towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Al-Nisa or Al-Ma'idah specifically speaking about Ahlul Kitab. Because they feel that they have this, this, this privilege. Just like we can see today what's taking place today. They, they feel that they're special chosen people. And as, they, as the Quran mentioned, they think they're the children of God. Allah mentions, قَالَ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَ نَحْنُ أَبْنَاءُ اللَّهِ وَحِبَّاءُ They say that, that, these people, they say that they are, we are beloved to Allah. We are the, we're the children of God. Where we take that in the literal sense or just in the figure of speech, but a, the element being here, that they say that we are chosen, we're selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're loved by Allah. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions after. قُلْ فَلِمَا so why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish you because of your sins? That you think you're something special. But what you attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all false. So that love isn't returned back to you because of your false belief. And other individuals find that their love overrides them. That certain forms of love can be a form of shirk. They love them as they love. They love them like they should be loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ So there's some people who take rivals besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they love them like they should be loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even, as some ulama mentioned, even the love of the Prophet is, is below. You can't equate the love to the Prophet to the love that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-asas, al-hub, the essence of asl al-hub is love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa far'u hub, the extraction of love or the branch of love is then the Prophet Muhammad but the foundation of love is love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find that are we those individuals who have this deep love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِدَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلِمْ آيَاتُوا زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Allah mentions at the beginning of Surah Al-Anfal. You know, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in strange places, not strange places, but places, ayat which seem to be strange, because Al Anfal is speaking about the booty, about warfare, about jihad, etc. But Allah begins the surah about what is what is devotion towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean? Just like inside Surah Al Ahzab, the confederates or the armies that got together to fight against the Prophet. There's numerous ayat in that inside that speak about love and obedience then towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the nature of the Quran. So Allah here mentioned that believing individuals, those individuals, either dhukir Allah wajilat qulubuhum. That when they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their hearts begin to quiver. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْمْ أَيَّاتُوا زَادَتُمْ إِيمَانًا When the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recited upon them, it increases them in iman. وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ So we need to assess ourselves that where are we from when we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Does it develop a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When we hear the Qur'an, do we feel a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do the ayat have an impact any, upon us inside our lives? Maybe because there may be certain things that we're going to touch upon in the end that we're missing inside our lives, that we're not able to tap into that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to judge any individual because there might be certain keys or certain paths that we've blocked that are not able to decipher what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to do or how to develop that fear towards him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we know that the Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're powerful words. As Allah mentions at the end of Surah Al-Hashr, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشَّةِ اللَّهِ That we send down this Qur'an, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a mountain, it would turn it into dust. That's how powerful the Qur'an is. And look at the opposite. Allah mentions in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, one of the first parables about how what a, a rock is. You find that some rocks, that you find that rivers flow over them. Some rocks, that you find that they, 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 they split apart. And some, some rocks, you find, يَهْبِتُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ and some rocks, they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how is that plausible? Inanimate object fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why some of the ulama, they, they speak inside the fasir, they speak about that, look, if a rock, shay jamid, something is just a rock, an inanimate, inanimate object, that fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the heart is supposed to be a soft ves vessel. A very soft vessel is, is the heart of the human being. Why can't that develop fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if a rock a hard substance can develop the, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a person doesn't have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside their hearts that shows more and more that this person is drifting away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that for some individuals love reaches such a level. Ya yulladina amanu may yartadda minkum an dinihi Or you believe whoever amongst you turns away from his deen. Fasawfa yati Allah bi qawmin yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbunahu that's why some of us, we, as we began, we, we take it for granted Islam, that we know we're chosen, we're Muslims, born Muslims, Allah's not going to punish us, we're definitely going to go to paradise. But Allah says, Ya you ladina amanu, man yartadda minkum, oh you believe, who amongst you turns away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what will Allah do? Allah will bring about a new nation, a new type of people. And what are the characteristics of these individuals who Allah subhanahu wa is going to bring out? These individuals, بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Loves these individuals. They love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves these individuals. Then you find Allah mentions, Adillatin ala al mu'minin. They're humble towards the believing individuals. Aizzatin ala al kafirin. Harsh towards the disbelievers of the time is right. Yujahiduna fi sabili lay. Wala yakhafuna lawma talaim. They strive and struggle in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they don't fear the blame of people who place any blame upon them. Thalika fadlullah yu'tihi man yasha. Wallahu wasiun alim. And this is once again inside Surah Al-Ma'idah about the characteristics of these individuals. Allah also mentions Surah Tawbah, the ninth chapter of the Quran. Primarily the main theme of this Surah is speaking 
One name of the surah is Surah Tawbah, another name is Surah Al-Qital. Another name of the surah is given is, is, is exposure, exposition of al-munafiqeen, of the hypocrites. So inside the surah, Allah mentions, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاءُكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ Say that if your fathers, your, your brothers, your f- family members, your spouses, وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ Your family members, your tribesmen, etc., and the wealth that you've gathered and this wealth that you feared is going to decline and these dwellings that you live in these things become more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger these eight things that Allah mentions right here inside Surah Tawbah these are things of what? these are normal, normal things of the dunya that we all, we all aspire to have but they become more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ فَتَرَبَّسُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمُ الْفَاسِقِينَ Now wait until the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes upon you. Meaning the punishment. And as we find that أي شيء تجاوز حده أصبح ضده Anything that goes beyond the limits, it becomes the opposite. Even if something which is halal and mubah, you go beyond the limitations, it becomes the opposite. Or if it becomes a distraction for you inside your iman, then it becomes something which is haram. So even things which are permissible can become something haram. Just to give us, if Suleiman, we find his ulama speak inside Surah Sad, we find that he got distracted by his, 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 camp, his horses. And of course, the horses, Imam Suyuti speaks about these horses were used for jihad fi sabirillah. So whilst the horses are being paraded in front of him, he got distracted from them, distracted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَطَفِقَ مَسَّمْ بِالسُوقِ وَالْأَعْنَاقِ he said, bring these horses, stallions back to me. So he wiped their backs and he wiped their legs. Ulama Tafasi says, Kinaya, that he then sacrificed. Some ulama begin to debate whether did he actually go and kill these horses or is he just saying these words, this kalimat. But the, the meaning is there. That he acknowledges that these branded horses, which I'm going to use for jihad fi sabidillah, they, they derailed me. Either they say he uh, got delayed of praying Salatul Asad, prayed at the end time or after the sun had set, etc. It's various aqwal mufassirin they speak about. But what concerns us is that it was a distraction. In today's language, that many things, common things that people do, playing games, gaming, etc. I don't want to go into the world of gaming, whether it's halal or haram. But if gaming leads you to delay your prayers, to miss the masjid, to get late for prayers, so now you can conclude yourself. Something which is mubah, permissible, or even playing football or whatever it may be, if it delays you from something which is obligatory, then the ruling of that which is permissible automatically becomes what? Becomes impermissible. Becomes forbidden. If that's the end result, if the end result becomes something which is haram, that's, we find that any, that's what the sharia is based upon. It doesn't look at a question about how many people do something. It concludes that if the end result is something which is going to be haram or dangerous, it was known as saddul abwab, saddul dhari'ah, Anything that leads to haram for haram. Anything that leads to haram becomes haram. So we find that mixing with the opposite gender, that if once in a while it leads to, to, to zina, that's enough for the sharia to make it haram. That's enough. It doesn't look at the quantity of when a certain level of promiscuity, lewdness, wickedness, haram comes to society, then we decide to make it forbidden. Islam says that no, even if one person is affected by something, then that's what the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids it. Because it will open up the doors for other people to enter into something which is, which is forbidden, is what we need to understand about the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that distracts the individual, these individuals, nothing distracts them. رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ These men, this is a real mean, that, look at the study of the Quran when it speaks about who men are. Who are real men? Study those verses inside the Quran. Their, their attributes, what type of people they are that we need to develop inside our lives. You know, some people just know certain verses. Men are more powerful than women. That's not the meaning of this verse. Qawamun, qawama doesn't mean this meaning of strength. It means the ability to use the mind and the rationale to place everything in the right place. And then Allah then even gives the ishara. Bima faddalallahu ba'dum ala ba'd. Because of virtue that the man's been given over the woman and because of what they spend upon their family members. They take care of their family members. So the, the, the role of the man is to take care of the home, to be the breadwinner of the home. That's the role 
of the man to take care of, of the home is what the Quran is teaching us. And so likewise, look at all those other ayat inside the Quran describing real men are those individuals that business transaction and, and selling doesn't derail them from, from the dhikr of Allah. وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ and establishing of the prayer and the giving of zakah. That nothing, these things of the dunya, they have moments of the dunya, they have to do what they want to do. But their, their greater vision is they need to return back to where? Back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they, their heart is, is, is yearning to go back. Not like some of us that, oh no, not another prayer. I'm going to come back to the masjid again, pray again, disturb me for my wealth, for my life, for my career, everything. No, Allah's placed these moments to see that whether we really do believe. And the test for us is even more. That if you look at the summer days, how the, 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 the length of the prayer in terms of how early Salatul Fajr will be, how late Salatul Isha will be, it's, it's a test of one's Iman. That uh, am I going to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the early mornings of waking up 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, forsake my bed, go to the masjid? Or are we going to be people who just jump out of bed in our pajamas, just stand there, read two rakah, jump back into bed again? And then come around and speak about world politics, state of the world, state of this, state of that. You can't, you can't lift a blanket off your bed. And you're busy making these videos of pumping iron or whatever you're doing. And I'm not saying don't pump iron, but real is spirit, spiritual pump. You're able to remove the blanket, get up, walk to the masjid, realms of, of, of the darkness to come and pray your fajr in jama'ah. That's the role. The Prophet said in his hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood, that if it wasn't for the women and the children, I would appoint someone to lead the people in prayer. This is the Prophet as I'm saying these words. If it wasn't for the women and children inside the homes, who can lead the prayer in place of the Prophet as Can someone do that? No. But he's, that's how severe warning it is. I'll appoint someone to lead the prayers and if it wasn't for the women and children, I would go and burn the homes down of those people who pray in their homes. Men who pray in their homes. That's not, that's not men who pray inside their homes. The home is designed for the women to pray at home. Or to pray your sunan, your nawafil, extra prayers, etc. Why have the masjid has been established? You know, people hide behind praying in congregation. Congregation, that's, that's stepping down. If you don't have a masjid nearby you, you're not able to join the masjid because we don't live in a Muslim in a environment or, or a, in, a, in, a, in a Muslim country. Then the next stage will be praying jama'ah. Not that your whole life comes in jama'ah or comes a, a stage less than that. That's why some of the fuqah have mentioned that if you live close by to a masjid and you don't pray in, in jama'ah, your prayer is invalidated. The prayer that you pray on your own is not valid. That's how some folk have described it. Obviously, we don't want, to, don't want to push this out, but just to make us fair and think inside our minds that if we, we have in new, around 60 masajid. We have 60 mosques in this community in a radius of two or three miles. What prevents us from being there? Being there for Salatul Isha as well. Okay, once in a while, a person may be tired or whatever it may be. What do you find every other day? You know, playing football, doing this, getting something to eat, got tired, missed the bus, don't feel well. Every other day. That, that's a sign of lack of iman, lack of love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet salam, he would say to Bilal, call the adhan. Give us peace and contentment in this call to prayer. And again in Hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood, that the coolness, ju'ilat quratu aini, in three things. The coolness of my eyes has been placed inside three, three things. As-salah, wa tib wa nisa. Inside the prayer, the coolness of my eyes inside the prayer, wa tibs sweet smelling fragrances, good fragrances, and women. That's the tenderness that I find inside my life. So the Prophet was, was always there finding an opportunity to find that bond in that relationship in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then it mentions, They fear that day whereby the hearts will be overturned and the eyes will be turned rolled over. That's what real believers fear of standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another place in the Quran, Allah mentioned, They convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they fear only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. don't fear any, any human being. And that's what a human being is. You don't, don't fear any human being. That's why many ulama they speak about that a Nasraniya Christianity is, 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 is deenun, is rijalun bila deen. Is men without, without a religion. We are dinun bila rijal at the moment. We are religion. We are way of life. We don't have the men to uphold it, sadly. Where's our faith, our love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It doesn't mean that we're malicious and we're rude towards people. We should give us that conviction. That those people who convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't fear anyone. They only fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah mentioned those are the rare ones. 
In Sahih Surah Tawbah, Allah mentioned, "Inna Allah shtara min al mu'minin anfusahum wa amwalahum bi an nalm al jannah." Inna Allah shtara. Once again, look at the language of the Quran. Allah has purchased from them transaction, buying and selling. What does Allah purchase from the believing individual? Purchase their souls and their lives, and given in return, bi an nalm al jannah. In return, is giving them paradise has been given to these individuals. The promise that Allah Subhanahu has laid down inside the Torah, inside yani al Injil, wal Quran, and likewise inside the Quran. And who is more truthful in his speech than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are individuals who remain true to the covenant. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah mentioned, مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا أَهَدُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبُهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَمْتَذِرْ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا There's men who remain true to the covenant, true to their promise. Whether they die or they return back, they, they, their focus is returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's only one path to get to understand love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is the second part of the first part of the hadith, the first trait, is love towards, then love towards the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. As Allah mentions that Surah Al-Imran, verse number 31. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ Imam Al-Wahid in Sadi's tafsir, or his asbabu nuzul calls ayatul ikhtibar, ayatul imtihan. You want to look, call in kuntum to Allah. Once again, to those people who claim that love. And that's likewise today, we Muslims reclaim that love. Say if you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fattabi'uni, follow me, follow the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. So that's a, the second understanding of love. That many Muslims say that as well, oh, we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yet we don't want to follow the teachings of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. That's a sha'ir, wa laqad sadaqa sha'ir kal. وَلَوْ كَانَ حُبُّكَ الصَّادِقًا لَعْطَعْتُهُ إِنَّ الْمُحِبَّ لِمَنْ يُحِبُّ مُطِيعُ If your love was true, then lovers obey the one that they love. You know, if you, if you love someone, you love your wife, or you love your, your daughter, you love your son, whatever it may be, or you love your father, you love them. You can't say that you love them and you don't obey them. Does it doesn't make sense. That's one of them, one of them also wrote any lines of poetry as well. كُلَّنْ يَدَّعِ وَصْلًا بِلَيْلَى وَلَيْلَ لَا تُقِرُّ بِأَحَدٍ So Layla is just like the Romeo and Juliet, the Arab version. Everyone claims to love Layla. Everyone claims to love her. But Layla doesn't recognize anyone. And they say that Layla here means the Prophet Everyone claims to love the Prophet but Prophet doesn't recognize anyone. Because you're not following the traits of obedience towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as we find inside the Quran that numerous uh, verses inside the Quran speak about loving the Prophet Ta'atuhu, obedience towards him. Some ulama have collected some 36 rights that belong to the Prophet Then they condense it down to seven basic rights that belong to the Prophet Actually, the following hadith inside Sahih Muslim, it mentions لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون حب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين None of you truly believes until I don't become beloved to him more than in his own father his own son, nasi ajma'in, and the whole of mankind. So that's the amount of love that we need to have towards the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Imam Qadi al-Iyad, in his work, famous work called Ash-Shifa, fi ta'rif al-Hukuq al-Mustafa. That's why some of the ulama, they wrote these magnanimous works, speaking of love towards the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Imam Suyuti's, yani al-Dala'il al kubra that we find, speaking about love towards the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Hubbun Nabi, bain al-Ittiba'i wal-Ibtida, love towards the person between between following and between innovation uh, that we find. Various works have written about the devotion that one should show towards the Prophet So he mentions al-hub anwa'un. Love is of various types that you find that exist of the human being just as we began with the nature of the heart of the human being. There's mahabbatul ijlal wa i'zam. There's, there's, a, there's a love of, of honor and dignity. Mahabbatul wali, the person as the, how they love their father. Is, 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 a, is a love of reverence, of love. Here we speak about any you know, linguistic meaning of love. That a person has that love towards you know, a senior figure, specifically you know, their father. Mahabbatu shafaqa wa rahma ka mahabbatil walad. Now the opposite. A love of mercy and compassion that a father may have towards a, a son. That's a different type of love that a son shows towards you know, the father. Then you find mahabba mushakila wa stihsan. A natural love that you have towards people around you that you share the same ideas, the same thoughts, the things that you do. So this is mahabba to sa'iru nas, that everybody shares this type of love. All these three different forms of love, and there's other forms of love that ulama they speak about, all these forms of love, they, they don't come together in one individual. You can't share these elements of love inside one individual. 
You can only share them with who? With the Prophet alayhi salatu That all elements of love are, 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 are shown towards the Prophet alayhi salatu because he is that embodiment of, as Allah mentioned, an nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. Inside the beginning of Surah Ahzab, the Prophet alayhi salatu is more closer to believers than their own self. When Umar al-Khattab heard this hadith that you need to love me more than your own father, than your own son, he said, that's fine. But there's one thing, Ya Rasulullah. There's one thing, I love myself more. Every human being loves themselves. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, no, you need to love me more than your own self. So Umar didn't say, give me a few seconds to think and ponder and to reflect about it. He said, I love you more than my own self. So he maybe could be speaking linguistically that obviously naturally you're going to love your own self more. And then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, Al-an, ya Umar, now this is what real love is, what li- real iman is. That you love me even than your, than your own self. That's what you find that even when ulama speak about narrating a hadith, speaking about hadith, people say, no, but the interpretation is this, but this person said this. You find it's common in today's language as well. Oh, but this sheikh said this, this imam said this, this person said this. But the hadith says this. It's crystal clear. There's numerous hadith which are crystal clear. You don't need ta'wilat. You don't need interpretation. They're quite clear. You know, the general practice of the Prophet is, is very clear. There's only rare occasions he went against the norm. Amongst those occasions, for example, urinating standing up. That only happened two, two or three occasions inside his life. And even then, ulama speak about the reasons why he stood up and he urinated. Because why? The, the floor was impure. Or it was a filthy area or a bad area whereby the Prophet ﷺ had to stand up and urinate. So his common practice wasn't that. So when people try to twist a hadith and say, no, but it's allowed. No, what is his common practice? He's, this is his common practice. As you find companions of Abdullah ibn Abbas, you read about this seer in their life, they've done everything in imitation of Prophet ﷺ. You know, one day he's just riding his camel beast and he decides to turn it around. And they said, why do you do that for? He said, because I saw the Prophet ﷺ at this location this area of land, turn his camel around, he's riding beast, so I went to do suit, I went to follow likewise. Person came to Salman al-Farisi, a Jewish man came to Salman al-Farisi and said, you know your prophet, he teaches you everything. And his joke says, you know, he probably even teaches you how to defecate. Trying to make a joke. You know, sometimes we step back when no Muslims make comments about uh, uh, Islam, whatever. What did Salman al-Farisi say? Turn around and said to him, yes, he told us. He told us to squat down, not to face the Qibla, not to use our right hand, use water, use stones. The Jewish man is taken aback that no stone is unturned, but your Prophet has taught you about it. That's the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. You know, that's why sometimes, like I said, I read so many strange things sometimes. Sometimes you're reading autobiographies of people and people want to, imp- com- uh, co- uh, these icons, want to dress like them, want to be like them, you know, curl their hair like them, wear the same clothing, find the same cereal they eat, the same milk they drink, everything about them. But why are they doing it? They find them as a role model. And where are we from, for looking at the role model of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam? Why don't we find him the role model? Yes, certain things may be just relax, that it's encouraged to maybe dress in a certain way or to do something a certain way. But why is, it, why is a person doing it? That's what we need to understand. Why am I doing it? I'm doing it for imitation of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Okay, even though technically there may be, it might be just mubah, it might be something good. But if you're in the intention that this is obedience to the Prophet ﷺ, to be close to him, to be like him, then what does it become? It becomes rewarding. It becomes rewarding. Because your inner intention is you're imitating whom? The Prophet. ﷺ. These people can walk around and imitate whoever they want to imitate. They don't feel, they don't feel shy walking around any and, and, and Saturday night looking like goths and ghosts and goblins and, and, and whatever it may be. They don't feel shy. Don't do, have you seen them feeling shy? They feel proud about how they're walking around, don't they? So why should we feel proud about the way that we dress or things that we, w- we want to do? Imitating whom? The best of individuals, the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. So when that person has that creed, that conviction, that belief, love towards the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu Obviously I'm saying there's obviously certain sunnahs that we find that technically, according to fiqh, they encourage etc. But the point here being to develop. That's why some ulam of hadith they speak that every hadith that you read, even if it's something recommended, at least try to do it once inside your life. That's what said Imam Bukhari. In the hundreds of thousands of hadith that he wrote down, they said that for every hadith he read two rakah of prayer. You know, these things sound strange and far away from it. That's why they were blessed individuals. Because they had that strong devotion towards the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. That's why even Sahil Bukhari is a side point, the translation by Dr. Muhammad Muhsin Khan. He was a cardiologist. He was no scholar. He was just a normal doctor by profession. He was in America, then the university, the, the king at that time. 
decided had built a hospital inside the inside um where is it outside um outside Mecca Taif built a hospital in Taif and he wanted the best doctors to be there expertise to be there so he came and he traveled to Taif so he went there for for money I'm a specialist in my field he was there then they opened up the Islamic University in Medina so from there he would then for I let me join Medina part of my profession part of my career he come, look at the journey look how Allah Subhanahu brings certain people he travels to Medina. When he comes to Medina, he's working in Islamic University. He's a doctor there, head doctor there. He starts having dreams. He starts having certain dreams about scribing and writing certain things. So he asks the chancellor at the time, who was Sheikh bin Baz, rahmatullah alayhi, what does this dream mean? He said, this dream means you're going to write hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. He translated Sahih al-Bukhari in nine volumes in English. So they, they, Allah subhanahu could take any individual. One of the biggest encyclopedias of hadith has been written by a person who's a Hindu revert who passed recently, a year or two years ago, inside, inside Medina, wrote the, the largest, largest compilation of hadith to this day. Was it a Hindu individual who became Muslim and now, and then wrote the hadith or the compiled or put together a hadith of the Prophet. So this is, this is love and obedience towards the Prophet that we find we need to develop inside our lives. And we said that a whole lecture can be developed about obedience towards the Prophet. The second thing that we find, when you hibb al mar'a, لا يحب إلا لله. You love a person only for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب الأخي ما يحب لنفسه. Other wordings من الخير. None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for him own self from the good things that you like. You love that for your for your brother. And here لا يؤمن as a side point. Whenever a hadith mentions لا يؤمن أحدكم, none of you truly believes. This doesn't mean that person is a disbeliever. That's the most classical interpretation is a hadith. Because some people take a hadith whereby the Prophet said, لا يؤمن أحدكم لا يكون مؤمنا That person uh, is not a person, a believer, is not a Muslim. They take it to the extreme element, said these hadith prove that that person who committed that sin is a disbeliever. That's not the majority view of the ulama. Majority of ulama don't go to that view. They say the mean these such a hadith is, is, is either tawbikh, a severe warning, or naqisul iman. The person is deficient inside the iman. So don't try to apply a hadith upon another person by saying, oh, this person done this action, this person that action. Even a hadith speak about a munafiq. Either, either tahaddatha kathiba. The person either, bimakna istimrariya. It means continuously. That a person, whenever they speak, they lie. Continuously they break their promise. Continuously they're treacherous. Not once in a while, I promise to meet you at 9, 10 o'clock. I got late, I didn't make it there. Oh, he must be munafiq. La. That's not what a hadith means. You have to understand the Arabic language. Either bimakna istimrariya. Continuously. You do these things, that's a sign of a, of a munafiq. And like I say, لا يؤمن أحدكم The person who doesn't love for his brother, what he loves himself, is deficient inside their, their iman. Another hadith that we find, Imam Nawi mentioned inside his Riyadh al-Salihin, is another compilation to read inside our lives. Riyadh al-Salihin is a book from the beginning to end, speaking about uh, common day things that concern us, about patience, about tawakkal, about uh, uh, utensils of the Prophet, his character, his behavior, his eating and drinking. That's why every house should have Riyadh al-Salihin. You should read Riyadh al-Salihin to see gardens of the righteous about the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Sab'atun yudhillumullah. Seven will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whereby there will be no shade except for the shade of Allah. Those seven categories find amongst them وَرَجُلَانِ تَحَابَ فِي اللَّهِ اِجْتَمَ عَلَيْهِ وَتَفَرَّقَ عَلَيْهِ Two people got together only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got together and they left upon that. They didn't get together for some business transaction or a deal or for something to do. They just got together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, met one another and then they departed yani, yani upon that. That's what the, the, the iman is of the, these individuals. Sheikh Uthaymeen in his explanation, Riyadh al-Salihin, he mentions it's not based upon wealth, lineage or family. That's we find that certain people they may click together because it's their own tribes people or their own age group or whatever it may be. They like to be together. It's not based upon any wealth or any, any lineage or any family. They only drew, drew closer in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, avoiding yani, the haram. They gathered upon this in the dunya and only, as they say, death did do them apart. So that's the only reason why they may be with, a, with, a, with, a, with another Muslim. We find numerous narrations of a person who goes and visits a sick person, the immense reward given for that person who just travels for that, for that intention, for that intention, for that reward to be, to be given to them. No, for, for no other purpose, the immense reward given to that individual. Because the Quran mentions, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ Believers are brethren towards one another. Because we have to remove this cliche that's, that's floating in our society that I'm only a, a Muslim or I'm an akhi to this person because he's a real akhi and he's not an akhi. 
Do you understand? No. Innamal mu'minuna ikhwatun. Muslim is a brother to another Muslim. Read hukuk al-mu'min. Read the rights of a Muslim that belong to another Muslim. Six, or fi ba'd riwayat, seven rights that belong to, to a Muslim. Then you need to uphold them. You can't pick and choose. Even the Quran, it speaks, who are the believers? Who are the Muslims? It doesn't give this inner any definition that some of us try to give. You know, if, he, if he's from, from my party, my group, then I can shun him. I don't need to give him salam. I don't need to meet him or whatever it may be. Look, that's not, that's not what the texts of the Quran say. And even those texts where it speaks about that, it speaks about a certain time, a certain realm, a certain era, a certain people. And when, when Imam Ahmad does that, says that about, about a person, this person is a deviant or corrupt person, it has a big impact in society. If I just say this person is corrupt, what difference, what difference does it make in the, in the wider world of things? So uh, uh, believers give rights towards one another in their belief towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only time you break rights, even from your family members, if you can break those rights, is when they're classified as a disbelieving individual. Nuh was rebuked. He was rebuked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Nuh said that he's, he's, Nuh said that he's from, from my family. Allah rebuked him. Allah said, Qala ya Nuh, inno laysa min ahlik, inno amalun ghayru salih. He's not from your family members. Inno amalun ghayru salih. His actions are impious actions. He disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He disbelieved in the, in the messengership of Nuh alayhi salam. That's the only time that you find that it is cut off from the, from the individual. So you find Antul Ahadith speaking about brotherhood and love towards believers. In Ahadith, find, Walladhi nafsi biyadi la tadkhulu jannah hatta tu'minu. I swear by one whose hand my soul is in that you will not enter into paradise. Hatta tu'minu until you don't believe. Okay, that's the first part. Most of us probably, alhamdulillah, fulfill that criteria we believe. Then next part, wala tu'minu and you won't believe hatta tahabu. You won't believe until you don't love one another. Another hadith it mentions if you want to increase love with one another and it afshu salam, spread the salam with one another, give gifts. Tahadu, tahabu. Give gifts, it increases love towards one another. A hadith Qudsi mentions, Aynal mutahabuna bi jalali. Where are those individuals who, who, who love for my sake? You know, so that's what a Muslim is towards, towards another Muslim. Wants khayr for them, wants goodness for them. It's not exposition of another Muslim. You know, a person makes a mistake, does something wrong. You know, a person doesn't, look, doesn't thrive upon that. You know, it's, it's a very, you know, I don't know what words to use, but it's a very sick, senile psychotic society amongst us Muslims. That person makes a mistake, that's it to bring it out on, on TikTok, on Facebook, on YouTube, and make a whole mass video about it. We're all human beings. We all slip, we all err. It could be a slip of the tongue, a slip of a verse of the Quran, a slip of a hadith. We're human beings. That's, that's a fact of life. Person shouldn't thrive upon that. But some people just sit and gather and say, right, as, you know, as soon as he makes a mistake, yes, I've got him there. To prove it. What kind of thought mentality is that? That's not a mentality of a Muslim. Because the, when you seek to make, find mistakes of other individuals, a hadith may, make mention that Allah will expose you even if you happen to be inside your own home. Will expose you. The Muslim is one who shrouds and covers and, and tries their best to, to encourage one another, help one another. You know, another person having a good day, not so good. You know, help them. Help them inside their life, you know, speak well to them. That's why I say even a, a smile it would cheer somebody up inside, in, inside their life. It brings them a good feeling. It just reach out to someone, call them, text them. How are you, I haven't seen you in the masjid. But not rather when you see them, oh, why, are you, why are you not praying for? Why are you not in the masjid for? You know, think maybe it could be something could be there. Something they want to speak about. Something's upset them. Something's that worried them. That maybe you can, they can pour their heart out to you. You can listen to them, able to understand where they're coming from. Because we don't have empathy. We don't have empathy for, for, my, for my small years of experience. We don't have empathy. It's just everything just, just black and white about people. I know I like to sometimes get on the mimbar and, and rip at people. But that's just at the mimbar. But if life is far beyond that. About sharing people's journey, their hardships, their sufferings, what they go through. Being able to understand that inside our, li inside our lives, what this person's going through. That's what it means to be a good Muslim towards, towards another individual. That brings people close to Islam. That, you know, this, this brother does care about me. He's, he's asking about me. He's there to support and to, to help me. Whatever it means it may be is a type of love that we need to develop inside our lives. And then we find, as Allah mentioned, read the verse inside Surah Al-Imran. Read the tafsir of this ayat. Whereby you find that Al-Aws wal-Khazraj who made the tribe of Al-Ansar. 
Okay, they became called Ansar when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina. Prior to that, they were each other's throats against one another. But when, when Iman came, they became brethren. فَأَسْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَةِ إِخْوَانَ وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ كُمْ مِّنْهَا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescued you from the brink of the hellfire. You just 40, 30, 40 years of fighting against one another. Iman came, it, it brought us together. That's what real Iman is. Not Iman is that gang violence carries out. Now we've got Muslim gang violence. And you had street violence going on before. Now when you become a Muslim and you're practicing, now still the beef continues. What kind of Islam is that? You know, you have to let go. You know, if you lived a bad life before, you know, whatever it may be, you need to let it go inside your life. You know, sometimes I meet non-Muslims who take more advice than Muslims take it on board. You know, I've met non-Muslims that you find people there to, to, to kill them. I said, category said that this person is going to, he's going to, when he meets me, he's going to shoot me, he's going to kill me. You know what advice I've given to them? Just go and speak to him individually and say, I don't believe in those things anymore. That's not my life. That's not what I follow inside my life. Nine times out of ten, it's diffused the situation. I give the same advice to Muslims, all eggy. That Sheikh, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what happened. He's pulling a strap out, showing me with the strap, what I've got, this, that, and the other. So, you know, that's, but this is the mentality. It shows you're not really Islamically orientated. You still got jahiliya. You still got ignorance. You still got the ignorance inside you. You got that street life, that street mentality within yourself. That we need to uproot that inside our lives. That real believes that those individuals will become humble individuals. When the time is right, there, there, there has to be an element of showing you know, some force when it deserves it. Your life doesn't become force all your life. You know, one guy that I knew, I knew personally, and he's left this country. You know, he'd done some gruesome things inside his life. But when you see, see, see him, you would think he wouldn't touch a fly now. And he wouldn't brag and boast about what he'd done inside his life. One occasion, I remember a category that he was in a certain location and a brawl broke out. He stabbed the person from their private parts and lifted the knife all the way up. That's what he'd done. And when he saw it, when I met him years later, you know, I couldn't believe the transformation because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides him wherever he wants, wherever he was involved inside that life, but he never bragged and boasted about anything inside his life. And now he's quietly living in, in some country far away, just quietly on a farm getting on with his life. And every so often he... He texts me, whatever, and you know, whatever it may be. But the point being is what? That's real change. Real brother change, that like moving away from everything. We still want to associate, we're going to have our, our foot in one side. They're my brothers, they're my boys, they're my hood, they're my, they're my, they're my people, or maybe they're nothing to do with you. If they're following a life of haram, you, the, the, you need to walk away from it. Shut the doors and walk away from it. Because you are guilty by association. You're guilty by association. And likewise, the devil will play in your mind. Saying, so what if they go and take out one of your friends? If your friend's living that life, good luck to them now. Good luck to them. They still want to live that life. Good luck to them. Don't intervene. And feel like I, I need to go over and get involved inside this. That shows a lack of Iman conviction that Iman really hasn't entered your heart. That Muslims, they walk away from it. As I point, read Malcolm X's autobiography with Alex Haley. Read chapter, was it chapter number five called what? Satan. Chapter number five is called The Devil. He said, I never ever went down on my knees. They used to call him the devil, the red devil. Even in prison, they call him the devil. The only time I went down on my knees was to pick locks. That's the only time I went down on my knees. This same individual became the, the most, one of the most powerful people in America. One of the most powerful people in America he became. Because why? Because of his iman, his conviction. Took a U-turn from what he was before. Okay, leave aside Nation Islam that he took them from 12 temples all the way to 100 and whatever, 22 temples in his few years of preaching. But he was sincere in his, his life. That's why he moved away from them when he saw the corruption of Nation Islam, what they were doing. What is it, the individual and he was carrying out, uh, Muhammad, whatever his name was, carrying out inside his life, that he saw what he was doing inside his life, that he moved away from him. And what happened to this individual? You can see what happened towards the end of his life. But there's an element of sincerity that he showed that I'm, I don't have any part to this previous life that, I was, that was, I was involved in. And so this leads us to the final part of the hadith. That person hates, and Ya'ud al kufr hates to go back to kufr. That they'd rather be thrown into the hellfire than return back to, to kufr. So here are three interpretations given of this hadith. The one is refers to disbeliever who becomes a Muslim, doesn't want to go back to his previ previous you know, religion or way of life. Or a believer who does not want to apostate. And Sheikh Uthameen mentions a third meaning, is a person who's tasted, as we began with, 
what these call these people may call the sweetness of these haram things, or actually the bitter things of these haram things, doesn't ever want to go back to it in their life. That's real iman. That when you see, that's what Umar al Khattab you say, whoever hasn't seen jahiliyyah can't really appreciate Islam. I'm not saying go and live jahiliyyah. <coughs> but that's what you find that some non Muslims, that when they become Muslims, you can see their zeal and their passion. Because they've lived the life, they've seen it all. So now when they come into Islam, they're just 110%, just like the verse that we mentioned, that Allah will bring a new form of people who show that love and devotion towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we as born Muslims, cultural Muslims, we think nothing of it. They, they take it so much in their stride in their devotion towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find that how many Muslims who've experienced these, 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 these lustful tastes or temptations that we find inside their lives. And they, they want to, who wants to return to that lifestyle? After tasting iman, as Allah mentioned, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ When Allah beautifies iman inside your heart, makes it beloved and beautifies it, and makes all types of fusuq, وَالْعِسْيَانِ Rebelliousness, wickedness, you find it despicable inside your heart. That's a sign of iman. You see haram, you see munkarat, you see fawahish, it troubles you, it worries you. That's a sign of iman. Not that we become tacit, passive individuals towards it and let everything then take place. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one. Allah waliyu ladina amanu yukhriju mina dhulumati ila nur. Allah is the wali, is a friend. He brings out the believing individuals mina dhulumati ila nur, takes them out the realms of darknesses to the light. You know, there's another individual I knew, he was 10 years, he was a crack addict. He would break into buildings to find a little fix. So he was telling me one day I broke into a masjid. So I broke into the masjid, I fell asleep. And in my sleep, I saw myself going up in steps. So there were signs of him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after he became, he became, alhamdulillah, became Muslim and walked away from that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do so many mysterious or strange things or show them his signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed them the path you know, of, of Iman. And for us, every day, the path of Iman is clear. Just, just read the Quran. Read the Quran as, we, as we're going to touch on at the end that we find that about what ways of protecting our Iman that we find of coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As what ulama speak about, ilaj da'ful iman. What is the, the cure of the weakness of iman? Because this can all be a, a textual any, uh, study that we find. This technicality is that this is what iman, what belief is. What's the reality that iman we find in the hadith that we find in Mustarak Imam Hakim, as checked by late Sheikh Nasruddin al Albani, that iman is, is like a, a garment, a clothing. It withers away, it rips apart. And you need to, fasalullah and you jaddida. Al-Iman fi qulubikum. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to revitalize your iman in your hearts. So a person should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi al-adinik. Allah, give me thabat, give me steadfastness, give me affirmation to remain upon your path. And just remember basic principle. You know, we have all these technicality studies of aqidah, what is iman, this, that, and the other. You know, we love all of that, don't we? We love going out and then lashing out at people. You know, he doesn't know his aqidah, he doesn't know his belief. Is that what a study of aqidah belief is? Just remember one basic principle and inshallah you'll be a, you'll be a successful individual. Al-Iman yazidu bi ta'a wa yanqus bil ma'asiyah. Iman goes up with obedience and it goes down with disobedience. That's it. If you have that inside your heart and your mind, you're always going to be successful. And Ibn Taymiyyah used to say that if the people who praise you, your heart is the same as the people who defame you, that's constancy inside your Iman. The equilibrium that you find, it makes no difference whether people, they praise you or they defame you, inside your mind is exactly the same. That's how a Muslim should be to find that, that level of Iman. We find ways of strengthening our Iman, tadabbur al-Quran. The Quran is tibyan in kulli What's our relationship with the book of Allah? Look, Ramadan is finished. How much have we read of the Quran now since Ramadan has gone by? We can all ask ourselves that question. How much is reading Ramadan? How much I'm reading now? A tafakkur about the Quran, tadabbur al-Quran, Pondering over the Quran, they say we're doing about one verse, pondering over those verses, what do these verses mean and the impact they have? The Prophet in certain narrations, he wept listening to these ayat. Wept listening to these ayat, pondering over the creation of the heavens and the earth. That's why it's not just about people think Asanid. Shaykh al Qurra, not, not, not to defend all this Qurra, we have immense respect for them, but I'm talking about seven five, that's what we think. This riwayah, this qira, this uh, sanad, this, you know, this authenticity, this person, whatever it may be, that's just, that's just tertiary, brothers. That's just tertiary. 
That doesn't really mean much. Like as I began, if you can't get up and go to Fajr in the masjid, so what if you've got a, a snad going all the way back to so-and-so imam, or you've got this shahada, you've got this testimony, or takhreej bin hadi jami'ah, you came out of this university, or this section, or that, whatever it may be, it means nothing. It means nothing at all. Because read what the Quran speaks about, people don't try to practice what they preach. Or try to why the whole the Quran the whole Quranic journey is about trying to implement what we study and read from, from, from the Quran. That you find Rubba Qari al Quran Yalanuhu. Perhaps the recite of the Quran, the Quran curses him. How can the Quran curse a person? They're reciting the Quran. Because they're reading the Quran, they're reading the Quran, the Quran saying, Don't do this, do this inside your life, abstain from this, and they go and they break that. So the Quran isn't a hujjah for them. The Quran becomes an evidence against them that we find. Also to ponder over the, the parables that exist inside, inside the Quran, some 80 or 90 parables we find inside the Quran. To ponder over Adhamatullah, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once again, aqidah, belief that you find to know ma'rifatu asma'ihi wa sifati subhanahu wa ta'ala. To know the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what purpose? For what purpose? وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بصير. That's the real purpose. That you're vigilant, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is watching over me wherever I happen to be, sees me, hears me, knows everything that I'm, even the inner thoughts I have inside my heart and my mind is known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, if I find talabul ilm al shari'i, why, why is a person seeking Islamic sciences? What's the real deeper intent of Islamic sciences? Is to know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appropriately. That's the deeper element of why we study Islamic sciences. It's not to, to do with what most people are doing at the moment. And it's clear, the intentions are clear. It's not something hidden. The refutation culture that we find, that's not Islamic sciences. That may happen in a person's life that you may have to make a refutation about something or say something about. Even then, your uslub, your manners, your characteristics, your behavior shows your level of knowledge. If you're rudimentary, you're derogatory, you're vile, you're filthy, you use abusive, childish words, it shows your mentality. It shows your level of ilm. Because read works of ulama, how they refute other individuals. If you read about Sheikh Tawajiri, famous Sheikh inside Najd that we find, who didn't get along with Sheikh Al-Bani Rahmatullah in terms of what Sheikh Al-Bani wrote. He didn't agree with him. Sheikh Tawajiri's son, he mentions that when so Sheikh Al-Bani wrote certain things, Sheikh Tawajiri refuted him harshly about his views and things that he was writing, he was saying. His son says that when my father, when my father met Sheikh Al-Bani, I've never seen so much love and affection in my life. When they came face to face. Not the way that we, we behave and conduct ourselves. Does you find that a lot of people, why did they respect Sheikh Al-Bani? They respect him because he's a man of principles, etiquettes and behavior. He knew how to psychologically debate with people and bring them back to accept that they're wrong themselves. He wasn't abusive in his language. He wasn't corrupt in the language that people go around saying, yes, we support the, the views and, and the thought of Sheikh Al-Bani. Read through his life, read through his works, listen to his recordings, they are there. Since the Al-Huda wa Nur. Hundreds of tapes of his recordings as he's traveling are being recorded of him engaging with people, speaking to people, giving da'wah to people. Why, why don't we take that side of it? Why don't we look at that side of the life of how he dealt with people, how he engaged with people? And that's how a, a, a Muslim should be. The seeking of knowledge is there for a purpose to bring you close to Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا يَحْدُثْ بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ And to reflect about what will take place after death is why a person is, is seeking knowledge to strengthen their iman inside al-akhirah. And likewise, we find istikthar fi amal salihat to increase in doing good deeds. Look at Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. You know, we become so te technical inside our lives. The Prophet asked, Man asbaha minkum sa'iman al yawm. Who amongst you is fasting today? He said, Ana ya Rasulullah. Who amongst you is giving sadaqah today? He said, I have ya Rasulullah. Who amongst you has followed a funeral prayer? I have. Who's going to bury the person? I have. These, these are actions. These are actions that show the person's, person's iman, this person's commitment. Is finding actions to get us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Was timrar alayha to be continuous. Ahabb al amali ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adwamuha wa in qalla. The most beloved action to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the action which is done on a regular basis, even happens to be small. So if every day you read the Quran, one page, half a page, and you're regular on that, it's better than the person who reads the whole Quran in Ramadan and never reads it again. So every single day have that. That this five, ten minutes to read the Quran or to make some dhikr or to do something. 
Tabi'u bain al-hajj wal umrah Follow up one hajj with another umrah, umrah with another hajj. Always trying to find tanawwal ibad, exchange of good deeds, of worship, different forms of ibadat to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dhikrullah, to make the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Father making dhikr of people, speaking about people that we find, keep your tongues moist with remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a way of keeping your heart steadfast, that you're always praising and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as best as you can, as most as you can, is a symbol of Iman. And likewise, dhikrul maut. Akthiru dhikrul yani al hadimul ladhad. Remember that which destroys the pleasures. What destroys the pleasures? Al maut. That's what the Prophet said that. Go and kuntu nahaytukum an ziyaratil qubur. I used to forbid you from visiting the graves. Go and visit the graveyards. Because it destroys the pleasures. Just like we began with the pleasures, even the halal things. What destroys them? Is to go and visit the graves. Go and visit, go follow a funeral prayer. Just go there, visit the graves. Not everything's a bit of innovation. Yes, people may do some wrong things. But see, that's where we get it wrong. That we see the wrong things. We don't go to the graveyards to remember death, to just go and ponder and to reflect. To make dua for the deceased ones, our loved ones that are there, make dua for them. Dua, wherever you can do, is it's, it's plausible. But to, when you're there to make dua for them, there's nothing wrong with that. And for us to remember the end journey that we're all going to get, to, that end journey we have to go through. Muhasabah to nafs. Accountability of our, of our own selves on a regular basis. And likewise, we find dua ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us steadfast. Allah mentioned the Quran, Rabbana innana amanna faghfil lana dhunubana waqina adab al nar. Allah, we, we believed in you and oh, pardon our sins and save us from the hellfire. Innana sami'na munadi yan yunadi lil iman. And aminu bi rabbikum fa amanna. We heard a caller calling to Allah. The caller is who? The Prophet. We, we try our best to respond to that call. Rabbana gfil lana wal ikhwanina ladina sabakuna bil iman. Our brethren. Look at Surah Al Hashab. So we pray for our brethren that who preceded us in faith to forgive them, to pardon them, and then not to turn back to the previous way of life. Rabbana la tuzik qulubana ba'd id hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma inna kantal wahab. Don't deviate our hearts after you've guided us. So these are the three things that we spoke about. First, to have that love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, grant that love inside my heart. Place that love inside my heart. Grant me to give me tawfiq, to do good deeds, to come closer to you. And then closer to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Then secondly, to have love towards the Muslims. To have feelings and, and, and empathy towards Muslims, especially the Muslim world where it's going through. And some of us, that, that it's very, very you know, callous, very cold words that we use. You know, about other Muslims, okay, maybe Muslims, they may have been corrupt, they may have been deviant, they may have done bad things, whatever it may be, whatever terminology you want to use. But are they not Muslims? Are they not Muslims? Don't we have that feeling inside our heart? Rather than use these abrupt words, you know, they're, they're being punished because they're innovated inside their life, they're doing haram things, they've done this inside their life, they've done that inside their life, they don't really believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Plausibly, that could be true. That could be true. But that's not how we, how, we should, how we should vision it inside our mind and our hearts and our tongues. The least that we could be doing is making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're your slaves, they're your servants. They may have oppressed themselves, they've done wrong things. Lift these calamities, these hardships away from them. Return them back to your deen. Strengthen their iman. Forgive, pardon them. Forgive those who have been made martyrs amongst them, hardships upon them. The children who are suffering, the widows who are suffering. That's what, that's what a Muslim should be. Making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their brethren individuals. And like as we mentioned, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to turn us back after faith has entered the heart. We keep us away from temptations and desires and whatever. That we know what this world is. As soon as we walk outside the masjid, what's going to happen? There's 101 obstacles. It's a reality we have to, we have to accept. It's the world that we're living in at the moment. That now it says, it says our fingertips. It's all there in front of us. So the only way that one can... Override that is by becoming strong inside their faith, strengthening their faith, having that ability to strengthen their iman that when they're there on moments of being on their own, that their iman overrides them. Gives them the ability to obey and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us the tawfiq and ability to taste halawatul iman inside our lives, throughout our lives, until we finally meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.